Hi, it's Dr. Lori, the PhD Antiques Appraiser. I'm here to talk with you about gold, silver, glass, pearls, jewelry. Yeah, lots of different pieces. I'm going to give you those tips that you need so you can identify those pieces. I'm going to remind you about the loop. It's going to be a game changer. Get the loop. It'll help you to identify pieces. Right out of the chute, I want to talk with you about Murano glass jewelry. Jewelry that is made in Murano in Italy. They don't all have stickers on them, and who's to say somebody couldn't put another sticker on it? That's a fake. So I want to teach you what to look for. First of all, I'm going to use this bracelet as an example. This bracelet is a nice piece of Millefiore. You've heard of Millefiore. Cost, of course, nice glass jewelry. Here's what you're looking at with respect to Millefiore. You're looking for the rods. The rods are really important. What does that mean? Well, if you look at this piece, I'm going to use this red one as an example. So here's a piece of Millefiore right here. And here, in fact, is the rods that are used, which are blown through the blown glass. And you're looking at this piece. I want you to look for these striations. You see that dark blue there? That dark blue stripe right in between the red. That dark blue stripe is actually, again, a rod. It's a glass rod that's utilized to make the flower form. Now, when you see those rods, you know you have a good piece of Millefiore. When you don't see the rods, you know you have a lousy piece of Millefiore. For example, this one. Look at this same red type of form, and it doesn't have any of those nice striations. If you put them next to one another, you can see, of course, the comparison. There are the nice stripes, the nice dark blue stripes against the red body on the one on my right hand side. The one on the left hand side has almost no rods at all. So you're not really seeing Millefiore. So this is the better of the two. I want you to learn the things that you can use. So you can get out a loop, you can look at your thrift store, at that antique shop, or maybe you're in an estate sale or a yard sale and know what to look for. The better Millefiore shows the rods. So that's what I want you to look for. Right there, it's easy to see. And having one that's not so great is good too because you have a comparison. We always want to compare and contrast. Also, when you're looking at Millefiore pieces and pieces of, of course, Murano glass jewelry, like these crosses that are made, these pieces are made in Venice, but they're not Murano. And people are like, what does that mean? Well, they're made in Venice. You can get them in when you're shopping, of course, around Italy. But in fact, they are not high quality Murano pieces. You'll notice that those little Millefiore pieces, those little elements that make up those flowers, they, in fact, are very, very muddy. They look like they're moving. People say that's pretty and they like it, but in fact, they're trying to actually make a piece that's simulating a good piece of Murano, like a good Murano cross, but in fact, that's not what these are at all. What you're looking at here, in fact, is something that also is trying to look like Murano, but is not. The other telltale sign, copper instead of gold flex. You're looking at copper instead of gold flex. Oftentimes, they'll put little gold flecks next to these um, pieces of the, of the actual Murano blown glass, these Millefiore rods. But in fact, this, this time, it's actually copper. Copper, you know, is going to be, in fact, much more uh, easy to identify and much in it more inexpensive than having the gold flecks. So make sure you know what you're looking at when you're looking for that Murano. Look for those rods. I'll tell you how. Other tips about, about jewelry, whether it's costume or gold or silver, I want to make sure that you remember some of the basic ideas. First of all, you're looking at pieces like this, these large necklaces. This is a carnelian beaded piece. I'm going to put that down for a minute. Um, but this piece from carnelian, they're carnelian stones. This piece, of course, is a nice piece of Italian sterling silver. Now, you're all saying to me, Italian serving silver, Dr. Lori, do you need a new eyeglass prescription? <laughs> well, no. This, of course, has gold overlay, but it's marked Italy and it's marked 925. How do we know? It's easy. You got to get out the loop. It's very simple. Turn on the light, look at the loop, make sure you take a look at it to see what you've got. And the mark is almost always going to be on the clasp. Sometimes if it's not on the class, you'll see it on one of the first few, of course, if it's a jump ring or the first few links, but 99 times out of 100, it's going to be on the class. So look for that. Nice piece, a nice, again, consistent chain link too. That's what's also important about that piece. Now this piece is a nice piece, probably valued anywhere in the $75 to $95 range. Okay, so you have a nice piece there. It's easy to identify. You've got the 925 and the Italy mark on it. Pretty simple. But if you saw this piece as well, 
this is something that might make it a little harder. Looks like a nice piece. It's completely unmarked, but it looks like it's gold, right? If you look at the color very, very closely, you're going to notice that this particular piece is really not gold at all. It has a gold overlay or a gold tone, if you will, but it's copper. And I don't want you to confuse it with something called rose gold. Rose gold is actually, again, yellow gold with a copper content, which gives it its rosy color. Real rose gold is this ring. So this ring is real rose gold. If you put it next to this piece, which is copper with a rose overlay, you can really see the difference. Do you see the difference? This one has a much sharper sheen, the actual rose gold, which is yellow gold with, of course, the copper content. But this one, which is copper, all the links are copper, the whole piece is copper, and then they overlay it with a very, very thin layer of gold, right? When they overlay it like that, it looks coppery. So this is really an inexpensive necklace trying to look like rose gold. The rose gold band is very expensive, but the copper, of course, costume piece is valued just about $15. So that's the difference. And it's important to see the difference as you look at these pieces. So to see the contrast is really going to help you when you see the real rose gold versus, of course, the copper, the actual copper. So don't be confused when it's copper content right? Versus, of course, the actual real copper. Remember, copper is very durable, and it gives the strength to a piece of sterling silver. That's 92.5% pure silver. Speaking of silver, I want to take a look at this piece. This piece is a really nice piece, and this particular piece is one that dates back to the 1950s. You can see it really looks like the 1950s because of the multimedia element. What does that mean, Dr. Lori, the multimedia element? Well, it's got a lot of different things happening here. It's got a nice faceted stone, gray stones, very popular in the 50s. It's got some crystals, aurora borealis stones. It's got these elements, which are little stones actually in white, but they were once actually gold. Notice the gold that was on top of them at one point? Well, that has faded away over time. How? The oil's on your hands. You're always wondering why I'm wearing gloves on, in these videos. I'm wearing gloves at my events. I'm wearing gloves when I touch anything. It's because the oils on your hands can be transferred to objects, attract dirt, and deteriorate them. This is from oils on the hands. It will scrape off that one element that they used to have on top of this. So now they're actually quite white. The other thing that you're seeing here are elements and pieces that are holding something else, like this piece, which is holding a faux pearl, and also, again, a cast piece of silver-toned metal. So this metal has been actually decorated or actually plated with the silver. It's a really, I'm, I'm sorry, it's not a necklace, it's a bracelet. It's a very nice bracelet. It's in okay condition. Eh, I'd probably put it in fair to good condition because there are some losses. There's even a broken portion over here that has to be reattached, but it can be replaced. We'll move some of these pieces out. It can be replaced and repaired. These pieces can be replaced and repaired, but that's a nice piece indicative of the 50s. And I want you to learn about style because style is going to be important when you're trying to identify date for pieces. And once you identify date, it gets you closer to identifying the value, right? To get that appraised value. Because you don't want to just look online and see what other people are selling things for because a lot of people are not doing that right. They're not getting the right number. So I want you to make sure you have the right value. Value on this piece in this condition, which dates from the 1950s, made in the United States, value on that piece about $90 in this condition. In good condition, $125. So it might be worth it to have it repaired. Might be a good idea. Don't poo-poo these pieces that are not repaired. I know I'm a purist. I do like pieces that are perfect and wonderful. But again, a lot of these pieces, especially with costume jewelry and even fine jewelry, you can do pretty well if you, in fact, spend some time and effort in repairing. And a lot of you are very good at that. Some of the resellers are as well. I want to teach you a little bit more also about some of these fashion jewelry pieces. That's a nice word for really low quality materials. So these pieces I want to show you. I want to show you this ring. I'm going to move this out of the way. I want to show you this ring. And this ring is, of course, um, a nice sort of statement ring, right? It's got, of course, faux um, colorless stones. They sparkle some and it is set in a metal, a base metal, and it's marked on the inside with a maker's mark. So this little ring is a nice ring. You know, it'll kind of look good if you're going to a cocktail party. Nobody has to know it's not the real thing, but of course not the real thing. 
If you put the metal and you look at the metal and you get out your loop and you look at the metal and you identify the metal, I want you to take a look. I want you to look at, of course, whether or not there are dents or bangs or any kind of areas of damage in the metal. And I want you to look for something called pitting. Pitting is relatively easy to find. If you look through the loop, you can find the pitting pretty well. And basically, it looks like all little tiny pits of a different color. That won't happen with a real piece. And you're noticing this piece is a piece of white gold. So this is white gold in the band. And this is, of course, a pitted piece of a base metal, inexpensive metal, that has then been plated over. So you can see there's no pitting to the white metal, and you can also see that's this one, no pitting on this one, and you can also see, again, the quality of that fine jewelry. So you're starting to compare it. It makes it a lot easier if you compare these pieces right in the store, if you're in the thrift store, if you're looking. So brighter color for the white gold, consistency of tone, right, and also the weight of the piece. So notice how thin this one is, if I can give you the thinness and the thickness. The thickness on the right hand side is the real white gold. The thinness is the faux base metal ring. So look for, again, thickness in these, stone, in these rings as well. So value on this ring, the faux ring, about $20. Value on this ring, several thousands. So yes, there's a big difference, but again, the quality is gonna be in the materials, and I want you to know what to look for. That's what I'm trying to teach you, what to look for. So then there are things that you wanna look for when you're looking at, of course, other types of silver jewelry, pieces like these pieces, and you might recognize these pieces, these pieces are, of course, pieces that are very typical of, of course, the tradition of Mexico, Mexican pieces. And this piece is red coral set in sterling silver. It's made in Mexico. How do I know? Well, it's very easy. You take your loop, you take the post off the piece, right? And make sure you put the post somewhere nearby so you don't lose it. And then you look right here at the back and it says clear as day, Mexico 925. <laughs> And that's going to help you to identify where it was made, because it's important if they're imported that the Mexico stamp is on it, and 925, 925 parts per thousand. Now, coral, the red coral here, is indeed red coral. It's the original, of course, coral um, material. A lot of times it'll look like red coral, but it may not be red coral. So look for the striations. Look for the black. Look for the black elements for the stripes in, this in these particular pieces. I'm gonna show you another one too. Both of them have a black area, that little black striation or stripe. That's gonna help you to identify that you have a real piece of coral, that you don't have something molded or something that isn't indeed real. Here's an example. This is not a real piece of coral and this particular piece is molded. It's on a 925 or a 925 parts per thousand pure sterling silver setting, right, with, of course, the top here, the pendant. But it's sterling silver, but that piece inside does not have the same stripes, of course, as the earrings do. So the earrings are real coral. The stone inside of the pendant is sterling silver, but the stone inside is not real coral. It's actually a molded composite. So be aware of how you can tell that. You have to learn what the true natural properties of these stones and of these shells actually are. In this case, coral has that little black line that you want to look for. That's a tip for you too. Other things that I want you to be aware of when you're looking at your pieces, we've talked a lot, of course, about jewelry, and we've talked a lot about pearls. Couple things about pearls that I want you to be aware of are different types and styles of pearls. There, of course, are faux pearls, and there, of course, are real or naturally developed pearls that, in fact, are a consistent luster, a consistent size, a consistent shape, like these. These pearls, of course, are a type that are oftentimes referred to as rice-type pearls, and they're very elongated for rice pearls. We'll move some of these out. They're very elongated for rice pearls, and they're nicely done. They have these little um, loops here of sterling silver to keep it all together. I really think they could have done a better job with um, making those individual knots right? And that'll tell you about value. That'll indicate value for you. So don't forget about that. I don't want to forget about value for you. So for example, if you're looking for value here, this pendant that I was talking about worth about $65 versus, of course, the earrings, which are worth about $125. So that's what you're looking at there. The point about the pearls, the pearls are important because the pearls, in fact, 
are something that I want you to take a look at. If you see again these little strings from the original, uh, from the individually strung pearls, then usually the workmanship is really substandard. It's sort of that they put them together quickly and they wanted to get them out to market. I'd prefer if they actually only had one strand, they actually strung them properly and went from there. These are naturally developed pearls and these pearls are worth about $40. This pearl bracelet, and here's where the, the value is going to change for you. This pearl bracelet right here is faux. It's completely not real pearls, not naturally developed, but the value is higher than the ones that are. This is tricky. This has a beautiful clasp. It has a gorgeous work the way they put them together. They are not individually not, they are, let me see, I think they're not individually knotted. They are not individually knotted, however, they have a nice consistent luster and they are made from the skeletons of fish. Fish skeletons ground up and then made into pearl shape. They're molded. It's costume jewelry. It dates to the 1960s, and on the resale market, they're worth much more than the $40 naturally developed pearls. These pieces, this piece, this bracelet of, again, costume jewelry from the 50s is worth $75. So almost double the value, even though you're not getting a naturally developed pearl. So not all pearls are created equal, even if they are naturally developed. I hope you learned some good tips about identifying and, of course, finding those valuable pieces of costume, glass, pearls, and sterling and gold jewelry. I'm Dr. Lori, the PhD Antiques Appraiser. I'll see you next time.